This podcast is produced by Passion Nerdly in association with the Nerds Domain and our parent network, the Southgate Media Group. This podcast could not exist without their support or from support by Patreons like you. For more information on how you can get involved, visit passionnerdly.com. and welcome to this episode of Pattern Recognition. Tonight we are looking at uh, uh, episode five. Oh, Power Hungry. Yeah, Power Hungry was the name of this episode. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, yeah, here we are back with our Fringe Rewatch podcast. Yes. We just finished watching episode five. Uh, it's continuing to remind me why I enjoy this show so much. And it's very exciting for me to watch it with John, who's never seen it before, because he is just... You guys have never watched TV with John. Yeah. John is... He gets so invested. I mean, I get invested internally Mm -hmm. in what's going on, but he... It's like watching a sports game or something. I mean, he's like, oh, ooh. Yeah. I I get into stories. I, I don't know. I don't know why it is that way for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not always been this way. Because when I was a little kid, I could care less about stories. It took me many years to get into reading, but I remember my first book I read, which was a ghost story. Mm-hmm. Like, first serious book I read, I remember that I was at a scene, and I was actually you know reading the book while you know dancing because I was tr- I, I I was running in place, mm-hmm. you know, wishing for the main character to start running. <laughs> <You know>? So <laughs> yeah, no, that, I've I've that, never done that. Uh, yeah, yeah. The closest thing to a reaction from a book that I can remember having, besides weeping um, during uh, Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, um, is when I was a kid, I read a Christopher Pike book. Okay, yeah. I was probably nine or ten, probably maybe a little bit too young for this particular Christopher Pike book, but um, they talked about charred bone and there was a discussion at one point about napalm and stuff there's a lot of Whoa, fire yeah, stuff that's, that's and heavy. i actually got nauseous and mm-hmm. i actually threw up wow and that's it but that's the only time that i can remember having like a visceral reaction yeah. i've always kind of probably chased it. it's a book i talk about a lot uh, i always get it for nieces and nephews and kids that i know it's called christina's ghost mm. you know it's been around for quite a long time but it was the book that really launched me for like stories and just the ability for a storyteller to captivate my thoughts. Hmm. Interesting. Who wrote it? I do not remember right now. Cause that, that was the years that Judy Blum and right. a lot of other writers were just hitting it huge. I mean, yeah. these, and that's, these are books that, uh, when they came out were, you know, I don't know. It was such a strange time, but they, they these books came out. And now these are still huge books for kids. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I remember them when they came out. Yeah, See, it was yeah, uh, I, I Betty, remember. Wren, uh, Betty Wren Wright. Hmm. And it's published in 1985. Interesting. Yeah, no, so. I've never read that one. Um, I read a lot of Beverly Cleary as a, mm-hmm. as Beverly a kid. Beverly Cleary. Anyway, yeah, we're getting a little bit off subject. We are getting there. off subject, yes. So we, are, we watched episode five of uh, Fringe Season 1, which is called Power Hungry. The uh, synopsis is... Let, let me see which synopsis I prefer. I think I prefer Voodoo's synopsis. And Voodoo's synopsis is... When a simple man is discovered who has the ability to harness electricity, dangerous and deadly occurrences follow, and our unlikely trio investigates this supercharged oddity. Mm-hmm. Did you see that thing? Yeah, no, that's... What a... was that? I didn't. Up on the ceiling? Yeah. No, I, didn't. I think it was a flash of light or something. It's a flash from something. Oh, yeah. yeah. But, uh, yeah, so, yeah, it, that's exactly what this episode was about. A guy 
uh, figures out, or he realizes, uh, unfortunately and tragically, through many tragic events, that he has the ability to somehow, some somehow he has been changed. But, as we get into our main synopsis, this was, let me go ahead and say when this was released. This was yeah. released October 14th, 2008. So, I feel like, let's see, the last episode was September 30th, so there's been a two-week break yes. here, and we did get hey, our yeah. first... Previously on. Yeah, a, a previously on with the infamous announcer voice at the beginning. Yeah, and it did all four episodes. I mean, it, it jumped through everything. And I was expecting, I mean, if you remember last episode, we left off with John Scott in the room with uh, with Olivia. Mm-hmm. And I was expecting that to get tied yeah, up. Yeah, for some reason I thought, I thought, for some reason I thought that this episode immediately yeah. started with that. But, but it did not. No, it did not. We got our, we got our open with our... Mm-hmm. Um, you know, where the conflict is presented. So it starts out in Worcester, or Worcester. I think they pronounce it Worcester, yeah. but Wor- Worcester, Massachusetts. Yeah, W-O-R-C-E-S-T-E-R. Yeah, it's like Worcestershire. Yeah. I have no idea. I'll be nice, and, you know, if you're a fan of the show from there, you can tell it us looks, how it's It said. looks like it's pronounced Worcester. That's how us people who don't know how to say things, but... W O R S or I'm sorry, W O R C E is actually one word mm-hmm. worse. Huh. So we don't pronounce the sester. It's because um, I know in England it's I think well the sauce, the steak yeah. sauce, Worcestershire Worcestershire sauce, yeah. which I can't say apparently. Again, W's and R's. I have it. I have trouble. But uh, anyway, yeah, we're in Worcester, Mass, and we have a. What sounds like a very bitter older woman yelling at her, yelling Joe. at uh, either, you know, we assume it's a son or a grandson or even a boarder. We're not real sure. But yeah, Joe, Joe, get up. You're going to be late. It's she she sounds literally awful. I yeah. mean, it's just like if I had to live with that, I don't know what I'd do. And it sets that that scene sets <clears throat> up a little, of a, you know, kind a of little a, bit. Yeah. And I mentioned, he, mentioned, well, yeah, he's got the two alarm clocks or he's got alarm clock that's been mm-hmm. reset. So the you know his alarm clock lo- lost power at some point in the night, but he's also got he's a got mechanical a... wrist watch, and okay. that one is showing that it's nine o'clock. Okay, okay, and then he as soon as he gets up, he uh, well yeah see and I missed that his his clock had been reset or whatever. Yeah, was it flashing? Yeah, it was flashing. 12. Okay, so, so yeah, I I missed I missed that. That was a little a little bit of a foreshadow. But he gets up and he immediately um, take, puts the thermometer in his mouth and starts checking his heart rate. So I mentioned that, you know, he probably was part of a clinical trial or something. something yeah, I mean, absolutely. people don't normally do that, right? Yeah. I've never not, done that. Not unless you've got, you know, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and your doctor has asked for it. Yeah, but yeah. still the temperature thing. I don't know. It it just it seemed like he was he was monitoring so, you know like he was going to fill out a a book. It, he doesn't in the scene, but anyway, yeah, it's as he's walking out, his mom degrades him, you know, mm-hmm. tuck in your shirt, run a comb through your hair. Yeah. Somebody else's son always looks so nice and put together. You know, she's just just an awful awful person. Um but yeah, so we get kind of get a little glimpse of Joe's day. He goes to work. He works for a shipping company yeah. or a courier company. He buy coastal parcel. Can I mention something about that? You can mention the lot. Yeah, I forgot because it I when he's so excited. Yeah. So last episode, at the very start of the episode, mm-hmm. and I want to point this out when they're doing the the scene in Brooklyn, and the crane and the restaurant. They're, they did a slow pan, and I'm always, I always am um, expectant of those slow pans where they show something. There's always got to be a little bit something more to it if the uh, director or the writer puts it right in front of your face. Mm-hmm. And there was this piece of paper that was, you know, for, you know, be a better you, here's a number, unlock your true potential. And it's like, well, they, they did a slow pan, and that is in your line of sight for a long time. I wonder if that's going to play in somehow. And Joseph, uh, or Joe, at his workplace, his, his name tag says Joe on his shirt, or Joseph, which, uh, you know, mm-hmm. I was like, his mom called him Joe, but obviously. Well, she called him both, I think. Yeah. But he has on the locker room door the same little flyer 
uh, that had the, you know, unlock your true potential and here's a phone number. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it said better health, better confidence, better you. And I freaked out a little, of course. Yeah, because he was like, oh, it's that ad I saw in the last one. Yeah, and we didn't mention it in the last episode, but we did have a conversation about it while we were watching the show. And, uh, but... So, yeah, go back to the last episode. This play, like, the first few seconds, you'll see the same, same Yeah, ad. the sign is on a telephone pole. But, uh, yeah, so that was in his locker. So, eventually, so we, which also kind of, you know, mm-hmm. the the clinical trial thing. I was like, oh, this could be something yeah. related to that. But, um, anyhow, it's just kind of showing him at work. You can see that he probably, based on that clipping, you know that he has some self-confidence issues. Um living with a mother who constantly insults him and puts him down and, you know, tells him he's not good enough. Yeah. I'm sure that that would be a thing. But then he's getting ready to, he's in his work uniform, he's got his headphones on, he's got an old cassette Walkman, and his boss comes over and his boss is a jerk, you know, just an overbearing grump. Yeah. And the uh, while he's getting chewed out by his boss for something else or being late or something... He, uh, a yeah. scanner fries in his hand and the guy says, are you kidding me twice in one week or that two yeah. in one week and, uh, find another gig, find another gig. So I'm like, well, that was getting fired. Yeah. I, you know, the, the, like the, that's the way I would have taken it. That's the way I would have taken it. And, uh, but so he ends up, well, he, that's what he finds. He's looking at his cell phone. And it's got pictures of a girl on his yeah, little flip like, phone. Oh, who's the girl? Who's, who's the girl? girl? Is yeah. this some girl you're stalking? And that's when the scanner blows up. Well, Joe goes on and takes a parcel to a to a uh, high rise building. Yep, somewhere and, around the twentieth floor. Yeah, he's up there pretty far, and you see the girl that was on his phone. So you know now that. You yeah. get the picture that he has taken some secret pictures of this girl, this receptionist yeah. for at this company. Named Bethany. Named Bethany. She's she is pretty and um he he doesn't have his scanner thing because it blew up. Mm-hmm. And so for I thought that he had just decided because he'd gotten fired, but he was like, No, I'm gonna go visit her again. That's what I thought too. Yeah. I was like <clears throat> you know, his last hurrah, he took a package, or maybe he even you know, it's what Maybe he was going to mail something him uh, to her himself, so he just arranged for the package and carried it there. Yeah, you I know, just, just just to see her. Yeah, who knows? Yeah, very but stalker-like I, behavior. It's very stalker-like be behavior. You can tell that he's very unsure of himself, and he, uh, she's on the phone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, he's very nice, with, and she's very nice to him. I mean, yeah. she's like, "Don't you usually have a tablet thing?" And he's like, "Yeah." Um, and then while, after she signs for it, he, uh, he just kind of stands there and looks at her. And so it's kind of an awkward little thing, but she goes, is there something else? And he says, and I felt so bad for him cause it's so cringy and, and awkward, but he was like, I was a wee below and she's like, excuse me. <laughs> and he said, Cub Scouts, I saw your Girl Scout patch, your brownie patches yeah. over on her bulletin board. And she was like, oh, I actually got those off the internet. I. Yeah, I'm gonna, I so thought they, they're, they're so kitschy. For, maybe he's put on and a so he was he was super embarrassed, and I was I felt bad for him. But so yeah. and at that time when he kind of gets embarrassed, her computer starts to fritz. Her screen yeah. starts to go. It starts a little bit, but then. Oh also, well, there was also the guy that came over about the same time and, and was obviously like, obviously is dating her. Or, or they're they're going gone they, they've gone out and yeah there's Don't some keep serious me out so late next time yeah we're still on for drinks Bethany you know and yeah. he so he's confident and he's handsome and um, I don't know he, he, he a little bit swarmy but I have no room to talk I can be a little swarmy sh- yeah I can do I can be that way myself so yeah swarmy swarma is uh, is food oh so is he greasy like swarma yeah, that's just me swarmy yeah. you're swarmy <laughs> yeah I can be. You See, they're that. swarthy and smarmy. Uh, well, may, I don't know. I've always heard it <laughs> said that way where, you know, people are trying to be silly about it. So, yeah. Yeah. Either way. Either I, way. You, 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 <laughs> that's, it, it, like I've always uh, joked in Texas, we say things 10 different ways and everybody thinks their way is right. I, yeah. No, I've never heard that before. 
<laughs> no, that's true. I mean, I just, uh, no. Th- look up, look up people saying Kirk and Doll in Texas. No, <laughs> no, no. Let's not let's not invite listeners to uh, deal with the the Texanness. You're not that Texan. I mean, you are a Texan, but you don't you don't exude the properties of most Texans. No, I don't. That's because I've traveled outside of Texas. So, at least that's why I claim. Seeing, seeing other people's ways of life. And, I mean, because you know. a lot of Texans travel and they still will retain their Texanness because. And how Texas is the greatest state. Yeah, in the that's Union that's and the, the that's the that's the junk I hear yeah. a lot. Yeah, yeah, well, whatever. I, I, I'm not from here. I'm a transplant. But uh, let's see here. So, yeah, her computer starts to fritz. He jolts out, hops on an elevator, and she follows him into the elevator mm-hmm. because she's got to go down to. She bumps into him as she's pushing the button. He drops his phone. With I don't remember if it's open or yeah. if it pops open, but the picture's on she the picks it up and his and her picture is on the background. So and she is super creeped out and he is scrambling for an excuse or trying to apologize and the elevator starts to fritz. And event, uh, basically the elevator Plummets, crashes yeah. it plummets um you see the brakes go on you see all the stuff happen it still crashes it goes down the camera suddenly is in the parking garage and the thing kind of explodes outward and it's just everybody's laying you know dead on the bottom but joseph wakes up yeah he wakes up no one else does right and he's running out of the thing and all the cars start to start up i mean he's like stop it stop it i mean so he knows yeah. that something's not not right. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, there's there's no way. But at the same time, cars starting up around him and the, his response, he it's almost like he doesn't think he's responsible yet. Well, I think he thinks he's responsible. He just can't control it, and he yeah. doesn't know what to do. I mean, he doesn't understand it at all. How what would what would have happened to him that he would be doing this? So that was our opener, mm-hmm. and uh, once we come back from credits, Olivia is we have Olivia and Charlie. Mm-hmm. And she's opening up about seeing John Scott in her apartment yeah. or this, her house. This is the first time, I mean, after last episode, you had all that take place at the start of the show. And now is the point where they talk about John Scott appearing. Yeah. And uh, what I liked about this particular exchange was that we do see, um, we actually get a lot of Charlie in this episode. Yeah, this is. Charlie is finally just now starting, and he's starting to see that, you know. As the episode goes on, he'll make some statements, and he's like, "This, uh, this is completely, you know, crazy, right?" But, um, but yeah, this is the episode where we really start getting a lot more Charlie, where he's actually investigating something, kind of with them in conjunction with them, not with Walter and Peter, but mm-hmm. they're kind of working the same case. And I kind of liked his line, uh, he, you know, because he's talking with her, and mm-hmm. essentially we find out John Scott appeared and then disappeared. Like- yeah, she reached for her gun, and when she looked back up, he was gone. And uh, so she thinks she's going maybe crazy or having some trauma. He's like, you're, you're trying to recuse yourself of this. Situation. And I'm not going to let you. And but he has this wonderful line where he's like, you know, next time John stops by for a nightcap, offer him one. Right. He he wants her to, Come to face this issue yeah. head on and be done with it. You know, stop running from it. You know, it can't be easy for you. And you're seeing it everywhere. You know, this is this. You're dealing with some stuff, and you need to, you need to face it. You don't need to bottle it up, or else this is going to go on forever. Mm-hmm. So, but they get uh, then it goes to uh, Walter and Walter and Peter, and Walter starts to he kind of yeah we get Peter is still looking pretty rough after his uh, run-ins with uh, evildoers last yeah, he episode. Had- he still had some uh, signs of wounds on his wrist and other places. And Scott, well, on his face, just he had yeah. he had red lines on his face, and you know could tell that he'd had some some trauma. Yeah. But this is the, this is a very human exchange where they're talking, and Walter tries to talk to him about torture, and he tries to talk to him about the institution, you know, the, the institution in Saint Clair, and what it's like, ha- you know, having part of your mind uh, inaccessible, held back or, yeah, inaccessible, messed with. And we get we get a Peter. Moment where he looks at his father and he says, Walter, you're doing fine. Yeah. And um, so we're starting to see very small hints that 
that their relationship is they're working on it. Yeah. It's it's very broken, but Peter is now after the first four episodes, he is finally open to building a better relationship with his father. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, they get the uh, Broyles and Olivia uh, show up and they talk about the power surges. Yeah. There was another power, sur- you know, essentially the elevator, um, all this, all the normal stops are in place, but the elevator essentially continued to plummet. Yeah, they, they, they- they believe it is an experiment, uh, some sort or of power surge. They believe it's a weapon. Yeah, they I believe that they're testing a weapon, a very precise electromagnetic weapon. Because there was another incident, I believe, on a train in Japan, mm-hmm. where the train essentially, yeah, Matt, officially, it's ruled as an accident, but all all investigations showed that the train just powered itself into, you know, a collision. Yeah, I think it was a maglev train. Is how they described was it. Was it a maglev train? I couldn't remember yeah. if it was or not. Uh, but I know they talk about maglev trains later, but I couldn't remember if it, that was the train. But so they go and they talk to a guy at the high rise who explains, yeah, the brakes came on. Um, it's just like the motor just kept going. He said, it's almost like a second generator came on and powered that elevator two or three times as, as fast or more power than a, our normal power source. And it just drove it straight into the ground. The elevator drove itself into the ground. And they're like, it doesn't make any sense at all. And uh, let's see here. But as Walter's investigating the bodies, he sees, he looks at someone's arm and she's got, it looks like a bad burn. And he calls it an exit burn. And he says, all of these people are showing signs of uh, thermoelectric trauma. Trauma. And so Peter, you know, cl- clarifies, they've all been electrocuted. And Walter says they were dead before they hit the ground. And he takes Olivia's neck. He asks if he can have Olivia's ne- necklace. Walter does. And he finds a spot and the necklace Levit- elevates. Yeah, levitates. In the levitates. Air, which, you know, that's when they start talking about, again, you know, uh, Magnetic currents being able to hold things or hoist things. Right, and they talk about maglev trains, and they talk about, um, well, he, been, he basically says there is residual electromagnetic activity still here from whatever happened. Um, and he, yeah, and he wants to get the bodies and their effects back to his lab. Exactly. So, Which I'm really, su- uh, uh, this is the first episode where they didn't question that. <laughs> no, also. they're like, okay, yeah. They're like, okay, we're going to your lab. We're going to your lab. Um, his, his perspicacity line in the last episode apparently sunk in <laughs> on, uh, broils. He had to look up the word and he was like, well, you know, I do want that. But, uh, anyhow, we then get a glimpse of Joe going back to his work and looking pretty awful. Um, I mean, he was just in an awful, <laughs> an awful accident, but he goes back to work and his boss calls him or he, he is like, oh, the boss wants you. Mr. Boyington, yeah, I think is his name. Uh, he, he keeps on addressing the guy as Ron. Or if we're talking about the plant boss, or... He doesn't... Uh, the, Joseph doesn't refer to him by a first name. He calls him Mr. Something. Okay, M- maybe it was just his name badge then. Okay, yeah. No, because I think it's uh, Mr. Boyington or Bo- Boyette. I think it was Boyington or something like that. Anyway, grumpy guy, and his name was probably Ron. Because um, uh, he probably did have a name on his on his shirt. But he pretty much, like, where have you been all day? And I'm like, I thought he got fired. Yeah. You know? But then he officially gets fired. He was like, no, get out, you know, what's on your uniform? Here, let me make it easy for you. It's not your uniform anymore. Mm-hmm. And and the guy, they argue, just said, I've had a bad day. Boss says, I've had a worse one. Uh, Joseph says, I take care of my mother. And boss says, I take care of my family, too. Get out of here. I don't want to see you in the building. Yells at him until he starts to leave. The guy goes back to work because he's on a machine that's been locked out and tagged out. And so he's Mm -hmm. working on a conveyor belt. And as Joseph approaches to try once again to plead his case, the machine kicks on and essentially maims the guy. So his arm gets sucked into the machine. So and Joseph then takes that as his cue to to hightail it out. Now, we, we've also uh, had a scene 
where Olivia, Wal Walter, and Peter are talking, and they mention... Uh, oh, yeah, you're yeah. right. I missed that part, yeah. Walter talks about that he had worked on a project where they started uh, using, you know, started messing with electromagnetic fields with homing in people pigeon. to uh, track them, like, you know, or, you know... So they could train homing pigeons to home in on, because the, everybody has an electromagnetic field. Oh, Okay, just a second. They're upset because every time your phone goes off, your iPad goes off. Uh -huh. And that sound really gets, Starbuck just gets going. And she starts to run around and bark and huff. My bad. <laughs> so, no, it's okay. It's just, but that's why they're all running around. I will yeah. take this opportunity to cough. Who called? It was mom. <coughs> if you need to call her, go ahead. No, I'm, uh, we'll talk later. I don't know what she wants to talk about, but. Okay. Um, but yes, yeah, so essentially every human has a, an electromagnetic field. There is a small charge of electricity in our bodies. Mm -hmm. um, but, and they, Walter had worked on a project where he was trying to magnify that so homing pigeons could pick up on it. Uh, the problem was all the side effects shut down the project on its own. So, you know, so they never, because like every time a girl hiccuped lights would flicker or something like that yeah and so we see that that never came to fruition but walter posits that someone has mag magnified someone's electromagnetic field and it's a human being not a that, weapon not a weapon or at least not intentionally a weapon or you know maybe the human is the weapon but it's a human being it's not a device that caused this accident um and yeah so that scene did happen before we saw joe getting fired uh, for real. So then we have Olivia working late. Mm -hmm. Broyles brings her some coffee. They discuss theories. Um, he reveals, uh, Broyles reveals these off-grid clinics where they claim they can help you with, you know, weight loss or better confidence or just mm -hmm. different kinds of, you know, physical therapies. And gives the name of a guy named Jacob Fisher who is who was yeah. a bio he was in biotechnology, um, but, you know, definitely unregulated and stuff that wasn't, isn't supposed to be done to people, um, but had done a lot of experiments and things on people all over the country. Mm. And so he, he basically says, you know, it's very possible that, <laughs> that this guy could be involved. So he gives Olivia, she requests the files and he says, it's pretty hard stuff, but she's checking into it. And as she's looking into it, all the lights go out. So yeah. um, she starts looking around with her flashlight and her pistol. And, and I'm thinking it's a dream sequence. Like, I mean, there are a couple of times where she has had bizarre dream, bizarre sequences, dream yeah. sequences. Yeah. And no, it, it was not a dream sequence at all. No. That's, uh, this is where I'm just like, oh, something bigger is really going on yet again. Yeah. So what happened? Well, uh... As she's searching around, the, uh, you know, elevator dings. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, okay, you know, again, obviously it's uh, Joseph, and she's having dreams of the elevator plummeting. But John Scott comes off the elevator. Mm-hmm. John Scott. Yep. Can't get away from this guy for nothing. No, so I, you know, and this brings up a couple things for me. I'm just like, okay, obviously... He has a bigger role to play in this. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm happy about that because I'm happy to see the actor from you know one of my favorite shows, Human Target, continue to be in this show. <laughs> I, I, I I loved you, Human you Target. You say you say that with such ease. I do. You just one of my favorite shows, Human Target. Yes. And you know, Human Target was way after this show, right? Yeah, it, it's okay. after this show, and, uh, but I, it's it, it's one of those things. Anyway, in your chronology, it's not. In after my this chronology, show. it is not. <laughs> But they begin to discuss uh, what's going on, and he's like, you're on the right track. Yeah, and, he's but, given her some, some information that's kind of strange. Mm -hmm. um, and it, <clears throat> excuse me, it, it would give you the impression that he is not, or that, that he is actually there, and he seems to know things, because this is stuff that yeah. just seems very odd for him to be saying based on what we know about him. 
And he's like, I love you. You know I I'll love you. It. I'll prove it. I just it. can't do it right now because that's not how this works. Well, yeah, which is obviously something very traumatic for what she's going through, you know. Starbuck. No. We're just going to have growling for an hour if she doesn't get away from him. Yeah. But yeah, so something something weird is going on. Remember I said a couple episodes he was hooked up to a computer like they were... But yeah, remember I said a couple episodes he was hooked up to what looked like a, some sort of computer and like they were downloading stuff from his brain. And so I just thought that it might be some residual or holdover yeah. from the synaptic transfer that somehow she's still picking up his signal or, you know, he's being broadcast and or I he, had, his, his ghost in the, sh his ghost has found a way to yeah, get not, in the wires. Um, th this was an interesting point for me in the show because I'm, you know, I'm like, okay, he's got a bigger role in this to play. Mm -hmm. And if you, you know, so much started going through my mind about her interactions with him because this is about the time where I was like, oh, that moment that she was inside his brain. Mm -hmm. And they were sh doing the, the shared dream sequence. And I was like. Yeah, John was like, pause the show. Because yeah. he, had, he had suddenly, he started thinking. In fact, he was looking at his phone at the time. And I was like, what are you looking at that's so important that has made you like have this outburst? Yeah. And I had remembered, uh, if you if you going back to the pilot episode, pilot. Mm-hmm. There was the sequence where she's in his head, and they go to different locations. I'm like, and I, I posited that each one of those locations might have a greater significance to play out. Mm -hmm. And one of those locations was a graveyard. And the graveyard had a headstone that said, he's not dead. Yep, and we did talk about that. And we did talk about that, and I'm like, okay. But last episode, they were in, it ended in a graveyard, and it was the... Uh, grave of you know robert uh, what, what's the last robert name? bishop robert bishop which we think might be either the father or yeah Walter's grandfather or for walter you know the guy has said you know it's too bad you didn't meet him and you're I, i'm just like okay D i i looked i looked at roxy and i'm just like okay yeah. I, I, he asked tell me, me for is spoilers. robert is robert still alive was that his headstone in you know in John Scott's mind, did was John Scott aware? Was that was this all foreshadowing? Is it all linking up? Because that's that's something that you know I feel. Not trying to be spoilerific in the future or anything else, but I <laughs> I really feel like J.J. Uh, Abrams is really good at tying everything together. Mm -hmm. You know, he's no, he th is. This is not his first show. You know, he's been involved. He's he's a really good writer. And yeah. I was just, I was like, I looked at Rossi, I was like, I have to know. Please tell me, is Robert Bishop alive? Did he know? And uh, she's not going to tell me. So, you know, no, I, I'm I, not going to tell I, you. I said, no, I said, honestly, I was like, I don't remember. So I honestly, uh, uh, I, well, is what I said is I don't remember anyone else in the Bishop line ever being a part of the show. I don't remember, um, like I don't remember another uh, another bishop male, yeah, at all. So I I don't think so. I think I think you're I think you're trying to find connections. You're trying to you're trying to prep yourself for big reveals, and I don't think this is one. Uh, um, I feel good. I was right about the poster. Yeah, I know, and that's fine. And you may <laughs> be right about this. I don't remember that though. So um, I'm sure that that headstone means something. Why yeah. else would they Why else would they do it? but I don't think it has to do with Robert Bishop. And you had said that there were more headstones that had been shown. Yeah. That I'd like I to don't go remember. back and uh, at some point look and see what the other headstones were in that graveyard. And to be honest, I thought that they were going to go to not Walter's father's grave. I thought they were going to go wife. to Peter's mom's. Yeah. But uh, that didn't happen. No. So, so I don't know. Um, Anyway, and that is me legitimately. I no, I'm not going to knowingly give you spoilers, but if you flat ask me for it and you demand to know, I will tell you. I mean, because you, okay. I, I already know what's going to happen in the show. So, yeah. 
me sharing spoilers doesn't really hurt me. <laughs> so, oh, no so worries. and but no, I don't I don't remember that being the case. So Flash I feel to, uh, I feel like it's a, I felt like it was a foreshadow that John Scott is not dead. Yeah, that's what I think it was, um, especially since we're still seeing his body pop up places, which we know he's supposedly dead. Yep. But he's his corpse is still chilling out over at Massive Dynamic. This was another episode where we had no Massive Dynamic presence. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was interesting, at least not directly. Yeah. Oh, and we didn't mention who was on the elevator, who got off oh, the elevator before point. they got on the elevator at the beginning of the episode. The the observer. The observer steps which, off the elevator, puts on his hat, and walks yeah, out. I of, think out I, of frame. I think that's going to be a thing with uh, from here on out. It's is the Where's watching, Waldo? You know, watching for the observer. Yeah. So yeah. So we. Anyhow, back yeah. to what was going on in the show is yeah. flash uh, to apartment or hotel room one four one. Is that what is that what it was? Yeah. When the door said one four one, and the door opens, and Peter is there. That's right. Okay. So we're back to waking up Peter Bishop in the middle of the night <laughs> with man. some revelation, but um, <clears throat> sleep deprivation is going to unlock some sort of hidden power for him. I know. Yeah. It's. Sure. So, uh, but she realizes she has some documents and she says, this is the, well, that's right. When John Scott leaves her, she sees, she runs downstairs to try to catch the elevator because he got back on the elevator and went down. She runs downstairs, the elevator opens, it's empty of course, but she sees the maximum capacity sign on the back of the elevator wall. Mm -hmm. This makes her, this, again, her little, she just is putting things together because she's good at concentration. She, she, like she said last episode. Um, but yeah, so she does the math. The elevator sensors show that it weighed X amount, but the combined weight of the people on the elevator is less than that by 165 pounds. And so she says, I do think it's a human being. And Peter was like, yeah, he I mean, would have been electrocuted or died at the same time. Walter says, well, Enough of that electromagnetic energy could have created a levitation field. Um, and that's where they talk again okay. about maglev trains and, you know, how it's just a little bit to make them float a little bit on the rails. And it could have at least cushioned him a little bit to, um, and then when it hit, you know, maybe he dropped, but it it wouldn't have hit him as hard as everybody else did. And since he is the source of the electromagnetic energy, it's not affecting him the same yeah, way he that would it not affected have been everybody else. Yeah. So they realize that they're looking for somebody. Yeah. It's um, possible it was unintentional and that he had no control. Yeah. So they go back to, um, well, it, it switches scenes and we have Joseph coming home and waking up his mom and he's distraught and he's crying and he wants to just talk to his mom and, mm-hmm. She is continuing to be a hag. Yeah. Um, what time is it? Where have you been all day? <laughs> you know. Yeah, uh, you, we we never get any sort of you know with, with the character. We're never given any reason to empathize with her or oh, to all. Uh, or to really have any sympathy. And I'll be honest, because as they're arguing, and she's like, "Pull yourself together," and he's just begging her to f- to for once in my life, please help me. And yeah, she's just oh like, pull your top together. And she's, you know, she almost hits him, I think. Or did, does she grab him or something? Or does he grab her? I I don't know. But uh... all I know is that she suddenly has a heart attack. And she's like, I did my pills. And she, she collapses on the ground. And he tries to call 911, but the phone doesn't work. Yeah. And well, he, I had. He was ha- it's obvious his powers are tied to his emotions. Yeah. And he's very upset. The lights are getting brighter and brighter while they're there. And so it's quite possible that he also ended up stopping her heart. Oh, I'm sure that's exactly what happened. Uh, that's I, I 100% believe that that's what happened. Yeah. Um, and he realizes it and he feels bad about it. And I'm like, don't feel bad. She was awful. <laughs> no, <laughs> you t- I don't know. I, that's probably not the right attitude no, to have. But, but I had zero writing. sympathy for her uh, as she lied dying on yeah. the floor. Well, it's one of those things that writers do. I mean, he J.J. Abrams has set up this uh, this horrible person that you have no sympathy for. She had no humanity. You're not supposed to feel sorry for her when she dies. Yeah, you know? I didn't. I didn't. He did. Yeah, he was her son. Children do that, but um, but yeah. So she dies. He flees. So he goes downstairs. J- oh, that was another thing that John Scott had told her. You need to find this guy. 
before Fisher does because he's looking for him too. And so we have that proven here. Um, yeah, because as because Jacob leaving. Fisher and one of his henchmen are down waiting for for Joseph Megar, and they trank him, and he says, "We're here to adjust your medication." Yep. So then we have uh, the federal bill. We're back at the federal building with the FBI agents. Uh, they're talking about because uh, they're looking for small disturbances. They're not looking for big events because they 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 realize uh, that the guy can't control it, and so they've been looking for massive attacks. Mm-hmm. But what they really need to be looking for is little things, little discharges yeah. that have caused problems. So they find that a guy at Bicoastal Parcel lost his hand when a machine that was powered off suddenly turned on and sucked his arm into it. And Charlie remembers seeing something about Bicoastal. Bicoastal Parcel. Yep. Starbuck. No. But yeah, Charlie remembers seeing something from Bicoastal Parcel on the sign-in sheet at the high-rise where the elevator accident happened. Mm -hmm. And so we get a name, Joseph Meegard, because he signed in to deliver that package. And it's an interesting point of pacing that they go right from the doctor finding him to right to Olivia and Charlie figuring out who the guy was. Yeah, it's all, it's, it, it's it pretty much shows of, that they're a step behind. Yeah, they're, all, they're, they're a step behind, and they're, and they're quick. They are so quick. They put together the theory in this episode with the electromagnetic field. That yeah. was really done quick in the show. They, they figured out who Jacob Fisher was involved very quickly in the show, and they figured out quicker than you would think law enforcement would the bi-coastal angle, but they're still behind. Yeah. They're still behind. Um, so we have uh, Olivia goes to the um, Harvard, to the house. With the, was it the house? Yeah, doesn't she go and she finds she finds uh, Joseph's mom. Uh, as soon as they find it, yes, the sign-in sheet, yes, they yes. find his address. She goes to the house and they, you know, finds the mom dead. Mm-hmm. And so she's on the phone with Peter and Walter and Walter's like, I want to know what devices are there. And she starts listening off, you know, TV, answering machine, uh, telephone, boombox, all this stuff. And Walter hones in on boombox and because he says that has cassette tapes, right? And Peter's like, focus, focus. But Walter goes and he finds Joseph's melted Walkman from the elevator. And he pulls out a cassette tape. And he pops the cassette tape into a thing, and of course he's got some super cool tech where he just feeds his cassette tape right into the. And it's uh, is it Boston? No, oh. it's uh, Ari Ario Speedwagon. I can't fight this feeling anymore. Yeah. And he plays that through, and he's like, every electro, you know, every because cassette tapes are the simplest form. Um, electromagnetic fields. Uh, mm-hmm. Well, once it's mag- once it's exposed to it, it's always magnetic. He was like, so if it's been exposed, essentially like a double exposure on film, your his, Joseph's imprint would be on this tape. So he removes the music portion in his little software there, and you have supposedly Joseph Megar's electromagnetic signature. Yeah. And so he's like, I need homing pigeons. <laughs> Like, and Olivia's there, and they're just like, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. How many do you need? Oh, not many, two dozen. Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, they did. She was like, "I wish you'd have told me. I could have been working on this." But um, so yeah, so they get pigeons, they expose p- pigeons to Joseph's signature, and then they let him, they let him go. But yeah, so John Scott appeared again while Olivia was getting a drink and mm-hmm. said, "You listened. He seemed very smug about this. You know, I didn't betray you." Um, in your heart, he kisses her. Peter interrupts. Of mm-hmm. course, he's not there. So they, they they go back to the experiment with the pigeons. Um, we also get glimpses of. Uh, well, I guess that didn't happen yet. They're you know they're they're back at Harvard, and this is something I really liked about this episode is that it is a much more light hearted episode. Mm-hmm. They, you know, and I, I was thinking about, you know, this is this is really lighthearted. They're having fun. They're talking about the carrier pigeons. Mm-hmm. They're they're doing the experiment, of course. There's yeah, there a, are a, there are a lot of little kind of comedic exchanges. I or, love or s- simple simple exchanges that are kind of funny, and um, 
And of course it's interspersed with images though of Joseph strapped to a table and mm-hmm. getting injected with something. <laughs> but but as far as our core protagonists go, Astrid and Walter, Peter and Olivia, we're we're getting some lighthearted moments. And then we get the John Scott stuff where he comes in and he says a lot um, and confuses Olivia. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But the pigeon stuff is still going on. The impersonating, or I'm sorry, not impersonating, the imprinting of of his electromagnetic signature onto the pigeons. And then, so, uh, they go out to check on, or they they go to release the pigeons. Mm -hmm. And Walter is like, I'm kind of going to miss these guys. You know, I know we haven't spent a lot of time with him, but I feel like I'm going to miss him. <laughs> and Astrid and says, we discovered that Astrid has some serious, uh, uh, some feelings. serious issues, yeah. and some serious feelings about pigeon. She's like, they're rats with wings. You'll get over it. <laughs> and so and he looks very dejected. He, he at does. That. He feel he looks very, very wounded on their behalf. But um, and they first at first they don't get the pigeons don't take off. Mm-hmm. But he whistles and they all fly and they all kind of flock together and they start. Going off, and so we have our first chase of the of the episode. We have uh, the car chase with Peter and Olivia chasing a flock of pigeons. And now, of course, they imp- uh, they implanted GPS chips in these pigeons also, so Astrid could track them uh, with technology. But we have Peter and Olivia tracking them, and then they kind of start to circle a building. Olivia calls in Charlie and other FBI guys, and they uh, they breach the building. Um, and Fisher is experimenting on Joseph, uh, wants to continue testing. He sounds like, you know, your average mad scientist, you know, look at what science has made you. You are special. Um, Mm -hmm. so they, but they enter the building, they arrest, uh, Joseph Fisher. Yes. And, but Joseph has already sent his henchmen to take. Uh, I'm sorry, it's not Joseph Fisher, it's no, Jacob it's, Fisher. Yeah, Jacob Fisher Jacob and Joseph. Jacob Fisher, and Joseph is the patient, Joseph Megar. Uh, Fisher sends his henchmen to get Joseph out of there. Um, from the passenger seat, though, Joseph has learned at some in some way, whether it's the testing that has been done on him mm-hmm. while you know all this other stuff is going on, yeah. but he can, can control his yeah, powers. He's, gained, he's starting to get a little bit he's of control. Getting, he's getting a little bit, uh, he's getting a... a mildly proficient because he fires up the car puts it in gear and runs the guy down yep um and so then he gets out of the car and olivia finds him and so then we have our running we have our running chase scene we have olivia chasing joseph megar through a bunch of construction vehicles Mm -hmm. oddly enough i don't know what kind of building this was but there's a bunch of like cement trucks and dump trucks and big old garbage truck looking things and they're running through him and I'm like, I wouldn't be doing this. But of course, Peter was told to stay in the car. He's yes. always told to stay in the car. And as Megar is running past a truck, Peter appears around the side and whacks him in the chest with a crowbar. Yep. So, which is kind of a, a running theme so far that Peter stays behind, but Peter's the one that catches them. Yeah. Peter, because he stayed behind, he tends to be in the position where he can, where he snags the guy because they're running from Olivia, but he's actually so she's smoking him out, and he kind of he kind of grabs him. Um, so yeah, so we have that he going he's going to the hospital. Joseph is going to go to the hospital to check on his head. Olivia's got questions for him. He just wants to go home. Says he didn't mean to hurt anybody, and she's like, "That's not how this is going to work." Yeah, you know, um, you're going to the hospital, and that's 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 that, and whatever happens to you after that is. Not something that, you know, you can't just be released, essentially. Uh, and we have, uh, we go back to the lab mm-hmm. to kind of wrap up. We're wrapping up the episodes. Yeah. It's a short exchange between Ast- uh, Astrid and Walter, which was cute. Mm-hmm. What's yeah. my name? Because he keeps calling her dear. And she says, what's my name? And he thinks, and he can't remember, but he says, it starts with an A. And she says, yes, it's Astrid. And she said, I, and he goes, I was right. And he looks so excited that he yeah, got like it. like a little kid. Yeah. And I, I don't know, you know, how far it goes with him sometimes. Is, it, is this, you know, is it part of his dementia? Is it part of his personality? Because he, when he went to apologize to her for sedating her last episode, he used her name. Did so, he? Yeah, he said, you know, he... he well, asked, did he say Astrid or did he say Agent Farnsworth? Well, yeah, Agent Farnsworth. He, yeah. he said, I, I would really like to speak with Agent Farnsworth. Yeah. yeah. So, um, 
but yeah, so we're seeing we're seeing their kind of little relationship, you know, build. And obviously, she came back after being sedated by him. So she, and she seems to be forming a friendship with him, even though it's a little, mm-hmm. it's a little difficult. But, um, but Walter notices that Olivia is looking pallid and says, "I don't know you very well. Probably not enough to say this, but." You haven't seemed yourself lately. And she yeah. says she's not sleeping well. And she just about opens up about the seeing John Scott. And she doesn't. She's like, I just need to get some sleep. Have a good night. But Walter asks, you've been seeing him, haven't you? Yeah. And he seems to be aware. Straight up asks. Yeah, that she is seeing John Scott. And she's like, am I hallucinating? And he says, no, they're not hallucinations. And essentially, kind of what I had initially thought, it is kind of a residual, potentially, of the uh, synaptic transfer, where yeah. she went into the tank. But he believes that part of his uh, conscience uh, transferred to her. And so she's got some of his memories and his thoughts. And because there's no room in the brain for another consciousness... um he has to, you know, the, this is the brain's way of working it out is mm-hmm. by making him a thing that she can talk to. Um, so she leaves and as she's driving home, she sees John Scott walking down the street mm-hmm. and uh, pulls over the car, runs after him, kind of goes down and she follows him to a locked cellar door. She yeah. busts in. Uh, and you see him in the shadows, but when she turns on the light, he's gone. Uh, and the room is just full of files and files and boxes and photos and maps. And it's clear that John Scott was conducting investigations of his own. Yeah. And she calls him broils in the FBI. I mean, Mm -hmm. she has to her credit played it, you know, played by the book. Mm hmm. She didn't grab all the files and take them back to the lab, didn't grab no. the files and take them back to her apartment. She called them all in because this is an ongoing investigation into what John Scott was doing prior to his death. Mm-hmm. And so uh, Broyles brings in, he's like, clearly he was investigating things. Um, he knew about the pattern because they were all pattern-related events. And he also seemed to know a lot about Joseph, uh, Jacob Fisher. And so that is where we understand that she had, he, you know, the visions of him were like, you're on the right track. Fisher is going to be looking for this guy. It's because John Scott was investigating Jacob Fisher. Yeah. So, and apparently in conjunction with investigating the pattern privately. Mm-hmm. And so we still don't know if John Scott or who John Scott was working for, if he yeah. was working for someone. Um, we just, there's still so many questions. Oh, there's t- <sighs> Sorry. There are tons of questions that are just being left unanswered. And, uh, I mean, this kind of dismisses one of my theories, which was I figured that John Scott was reaching out from Massive Dynamic, where mm-hmm. his body was. Yeah. And so that, that's been dismissed. No, it's, it is his con- consciousness is partially shared with her now. Yeah. And so, um, or, or it was, and... Yeah, with him disappearing once he found that once she found you think that that's room, over? it might be over. I don't. I honestly I don't wow. remember. But um, that that that's kind of that that be that. It's like it's like bad. being it, it, to me because you know we had the hello live yeah. from the last episode, but he gave no information. He mm-hmm. just appeared. In this episode, she didn't have a conversation with that John Scott vision yeah. until. Broyles mentioned Jacob Fisher, so to me that triggered the memory, mm-hmm. and that's why he showed up. The lights went out as she was reading about Fisher. The lights went out. The memory was like, "I have information yeah. that you need," and but her brain is going, "This isn't my memory. Why, you know?" And so it it manifested in this way. So that's that's kind of how I saw it. Mm-hmm. But of course, he also found some personal effects. He brings her a little lockbox. In the box are pictures, like, childhood photos of John Scott and his family. And, of course, and John knew it was coming before he saw it. Yeah. Uh, it, it's what I would have done as, you know, as a GM or whatever to you do call the, me, game master. Because he kept, John Scott's thing had always been, you know, in these visions, he was like, I love you. Gee. 
John Scott's thing in all these visions was he would reiterate, I'm going to prove it to you that I love you. And then the yeah. last time he saw her before he kissed her, he says, I love you, Liv, always. And, of course, she finds a ring box. And it's got a nice little diamond ring in it. Mm-hmm. And on the inside of the ring, it says always. Yeah, a little inscription. And I don't so. want to hear from any Snape lovers about always being associated with <laughs> Severus Snape and, and Lily Potter. Leave it. I don't have time for creepy McCreep face and, and his weird stalkery torch burning. Not um, that we're calling the actor that because no, we actually absolutely love I love the Alan actor. Rickman. Alan My is problem awesome. is, is I believe people have... This has nothing to do with French. People have romanticized Severus Snape because they love Alan Rickman's portrayal of him, and they love Alan Rickman. Yeah. Severus Snape was an odious individual and insufferable. <laughs> so, <laughs> he was a victim of Dumbledore's treachery. It's all whatever. That's Unlike John four. Scott, who was neither, you know. Yeah. We're who gonna, who his, had very nice teeth and uh, huge teeth. great hair. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, we'll have to save that for my Harry Potter rant podcast that is never going to happen because it'll have two episodes and it'll oh. just be about it'll just be about Snape. I know and we're, we're going to make it a Patreon exclusive. Oh, yeah, we should go. On, yeah, into my rants. Yeah, we're going to we're going we're gonna to do that one in elves. Uh, so. Elves. Ugh. Anyway, but so, uh, so that's yeah. kind of where the episode wraps up. We we never got massive dynamic. There wasn't a mm-hmm. to my there wasn't an end of episode stinger stinger, you know, that made me go, Oh, what? There wasn't yeah. one of those this time. It was just her finding the ring and remembering that he said that he loved her always. And so mm-hmm. <sighs> powerful scene, powerful, powerful scene. scene, good show, good show. I love this show. Can't wait. There's so many episodes I want to get to and I have no idea where they are. And there's so much stuff I want to talk about that I can't because John, I, I'm not too, there yet. It's, he's not there yet, and it's way too spoilery. And and really, some of the stuff that happens later on in the show that just makes you go, "Huh." Uh, I want that. I want that completely unteased reaction from him <laughs> when that stuff comes out. So that was uh, that was this episode. Uh, notable guest stars mm-hmm. was the only guy that was really a guest star was Joseph. Um, yeah. Well, I guess Jacob Fisher. Yeah. Let's see. So the, who, uh, the suit, the building designer, the guy who was the elevator, he, he had a very small role. He did. This. but I, you know, I don't think that would be considered a guest starring though. No, you're right. Ron, uh, the boss, that was his name. Mm-hmm. He's played by Glenn Fleshler. Uh, let's see here. Whoa. I can hear her. Sorry. Let us see here. Who do we have? We have Eben uh, Moss Bockrock was Joseph Megar. Hmm. Let's see if he's been in anything of note that we would have seen. He's in the Punisher series. Ooh, okay. Uh, he was also in some stuff I've never heard of. Persons of Interest. He was also on The Last Ship. He was in that show Believe. He kind of looks like the guy who designed Daredevil's suit. But I don't, th- it, it wasn't him. But he has that, that similar appearance, that kind of, you know, very skinny kind of He plays somebody look. called David Lieberman, maybe, or okay. Lieber or something. Hmm. Who knows? Might be. Might be the same guy. Uh, but didn't say he was in Daredevil. Max yeah. Baker played Jacob Fisher, and he was super creepy. Yes. Super creepy. And the mother was played by Mary Louise Burke. And her picture is so sweet and friendly, but she played such an awful person so <laughs> easily. And was she in anything? Oh, probably. I clicked off. Let's see. Oh, who are we looking at? I just clicked. I clicked back to the most ah. pull-up trivia. Let's see. Mary Louise Burke. Yeah. She's been in Meet Joe Black. Oh, okay. Sideways. Uh, I love you, Philip Morris. Bringing out the dead. She was in an episode of Longmire, The Mist. Oh, she's been in all kinds wow. of stuff. Yeah, she, the Mist I, TV show, not the movie. Yeah, no, that's so goodness. Baby Daddy. Yeah, so it's very she's, familiar. She's face. been in, she's she's done a lot. She's been in a lot of stuff. 
So, but let's go look up some uh, trivia for this episode. See what they have. See what the glyphs spelled out. I really need oh. to look up and figure out how they know what the glyphs are spelling because yeah. I have not figured that out. So, the, well, some of them, like the the, uh, the little the dot frog, moves around. The frog had a letter on its back. Well, it's got a Greek symbol. Oh, okay. It's got fire or whatever on its back. But uh, also at the same time, Walterisms. Yeah. Uh, there were a lot. I was going to get to that after oh, okay. trivia. Let's do the trivia first. Uh, yeah. Walterisms is usually the closer, I thought. But uh, we have uh-huh. trivia. The glyphs translate to spell the word surge. Well, that works. Mm-hmm. Uh, we also, they mentioned the observer being spotted. And that's it. That's it. Well, we mentioned everything else on our own. So, see. Do, 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 do. Um, but yeah, Walterisms this time were really no, the, the Walterism that I think I would say was my favorite was not really a Walterism in the sense that it was like something he said, but, um, where did my notes go? They've Mm -hmm. completely disappeared. For me, it's, uh, it was more of an exchange, but was when he's working on the pigeons and Olivia says... You're not going to fry these uh, pigeons, are not, you? Yeah, he's like, stranger things have happened. Yeah, yeah, and I had that one marked out. Yeah, Peter's like, uh, that should be a tagline or something. Or yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, what else do we have? Astrid asking Walter, are you, uh, are you sure this is going to work? As the birds are flying away, and he says, of course not. <laughs> so, yeah. But my favorite... And let's not forget him. Oh, sorry. What, what is your favorite? Yeah, because before, I bet, you, I bet, before I, you steal I my bet thunder... your favorite is the really... Uh, when, when they're in the uh, uh, motel room discussing the maglev trains and how Joseph could have been um, protected by some sort of electromagnetic field cushion... Walter is moving around very strangely. You yeah. see him kind of like sliding Does he have around. To go to the bathroom or something. Yeah, he was being very odd. And then, but at, right as the scene is closing, he reaches out and he shocks Peter's ear. Yeah. And <laughs> and at the end, he he's kind of marching in place, where he's kind of sliding his feet around. He goes, "Wool socks." And so, <laughs> you know, I, I thought that was good. That's 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 classic Walter for you. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, there wasn't any time where he said. Something particular, like a lengthy convers, a lengthy phrase, that was a Walterism. But that whole scene, his behavior in it was very Walter Bishop. So, oh, very much so. I I enjoyed it quite a bit. But that is our episode for tonight, and that we watched uh, again. Power Surge, episode five of season one, uh, for. F- Pattern recognition, mm-hmm. our fringe rewatch podcast. Join us next time. For episode six, which I do not know the name of right now, and my voodoo has gone to sleep. So, um, but we will be back next week. Same fringe time, same fringe channel. And we, uh, again, find us on social media Patreon, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and T Public if you'd like to buy some shirts. I got to get a pattern recognition shirt up there. Uh, Hopefully, by the time this is released, that will already be done. But. Thank you guys for listening, and we'll be back next time. This has been a production of the Southgate Media Group. For more podcasts like this one, head over to southgatemediagroup.com.